Open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Uh, and as you're turning there, I just want to say thank you once again to Dave Doomer and to the Great Commission team for all the work that was done uh, this last month in July to, to bring our focus outside of these four walls and to remind us that there's a whole world out there that needs Jesus. So can you just give a hand once again to the Great Commission team and Dave Doomer? Some of you know that for a time, uh, one of my hobbies was knife making. Um, I'm reminded of this whenever I'm asked for my email address somewhere, and I feel obligated to explain to the wide-eyed cashier uh, why the word knives is part of my email address. You know, I, I promise I'm not a weirdo, I usually end up saying. But for me, the most stressful part of, of knife making, believe it or not, was always putting the knife handles together. It wasn't the sharp part. It wasn't the pointy part. It was putting the handles on the knife, and that was because it meant working with a fast-drying two-part epoxy that you had to mix just right and apply at just the right time. And if you're not familiar with epoxy, it's like glue, but it's stronger. And some of the strongest epoxy is so strong that that its ingredients have to be stored in two parts, or else it won't stay liquid. It'll, it'll you know, turn to rock in the packaging before you ever get a chance to use it. So instead, it comes packaged in two separate containers, sometimes uh, like syringes. And you only squeeze out and mix the two parts together right before you're ready to put something together forever. <laughs> Otherwise, you... You don't mix them. But it took me a while to figure all this out, probably because I didn't bother to read the directions. And so uh, I'm sure I'm the only one. And so I've had some bad experiences where I mixed the wrong amounts of the two parts together, and I had the knife handles fall apart. And then I've had some bad experiences where I mixed the, the right amounts of the two parts together, but I just did it too soon before I was ready to apply them to the knife handles, and so they set up, they cured too quickly, and so by the time I put it on my handle, they were cured too much, and the knife handle, once again, fell apart. The short of it is, even though I eventually mastered two-part epoxy, to this day I start to sweat a little bit whenever I think about assembling knife handles, because the two parts of that epoxy had to go together just right, and they had to be applied at just the right time. We left off five weeks ago near the end of chapter 16 with the big idea or the proposition of our text being this, that you cannot separate the Christ from the cross. Like a two-part epoxy, the, the person and the work of Christ must go together to bring about our redemption. But the trick is they have to go together just right, and they have to be applied at just the right time. And so you remember that Peter had, had just publicly declared that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the long prophesied Savior and heir to David's throne that Israel had been waiting for. He got the first part right, right? He, he connected Jesus with the person of the Christ. But, but then what happens? No sooner have the words left Peter's mouth, we saw that Jesus then strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. And so then we asked what I think was a pretty sensible question. We asked, why? Why would Jesus want to keep this news a secret? And, and most likely, we said, the reason was because to both the Jews and the Romans, Christ was still a combustible word, a word groaning with a payload of wrong meaning. The work of the Christ most people expected was preloaded with centuries of misunderstanding and baggage and potentially dangerous half-truths. What I mean is that to, to the Romans, to mention the Christ was to speak of insurrection because they knew that to the Jews, it conjured up the image of their rightful king bursting onto the scene of world history with political power and might to vindicate Israel, to conquer their enemies, which was Rome at the time, and set up an everlasting kingdom ruled with a rod of iron. 
That was the work of the Christ that every Jew longed for. And that longing seethed under the oppression of Rome. It seethed just beneath the surface of every Jewish crowd. It was a tinderbox nation nation just waiting for someone to drop a match. And the wrong kind of Christ was exactly that kind of match. Because, yes, the disciples now knew for sure who Jesus was, who this person leading them was. He was the Christ. They had one part right. But they didn't yet understand the part about what the Christ had come to do. The disciples knew the person of the Christ, but they didn't yet understand the work of the Christ. And and those two parts must go together. They must go together just right, and they must go together at just the right time. The person and the work of Christ can never be divorced from one another or the one mixed wrongly with the other in public proclamation, or it will always lead to things falling apart. And in this case, as Barclay put it, if the disciples had gone out to the people and preached their own ideas about the Christ right then, all they would have succeeded in doing would have been to raise a tragic rebellion. Before they could preach that Jesus was the Messiah, they had to learn what that meant. And so because Jesus wanted to make sure that a correct connection between the person and the work of Christ was formed first in his disciples' mind, just just as soon as Peter has confessed this truth about Jesus' identity publicly, Jesus swears them all to silence. And not only that, he abruptly turns their little road trip around, they're heading north, he turns it around, and they start heading southward to Jerusalem, because that's where the second part of the epoxy waited. Jesus wanted to forge an unbreakable connection between who he was and what he was there for in the disciples' minds. And what the Christ was there on earth for, most importantly, most urgently, most necessarily, he revealed to them, was to suffer and die and rise again in Jerusalem. That was the primary work of the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. You cannot separate the Christ from the cross. Now, if you remember, Peter wasn't really happy about this news. He, he wasn't happy when he heard about this new plan. It It's true, Jesus also said he was going to be raised on the third day, you know, as as part of his messianic work, but no one seems to have heard that happy ending, Peter included. Instead, all he seems to have heard was the unthinkable, that both his friend and his dreams were about to come to an end. And so what does he try to do? He tries to stop Jesus. He tries to get in his way. In his mind, if Jesus was going to Jerusalem as the Messiah, it needed to be to take back his rightful place on David's throne. He, he, had to, he had to, that was his purpose in his mind. The purpose of this trip needed to be glory. The purpose of this trip to Jerusalem in Peter's mind needed to be the return of the king for his crown not suffering in death. And so he tries to stop Jesus. This madness has to end, Peter thinks. So he grabs hold of Jesus. He tries to knock some sense into him. And he either physically blocks the way to Jerusalem with his own body as he does this, or we're not sure which, or he turns the master around so that now Jesus' back is to Jerusalem. And then Peter is ordering Jesus, right? Have you ever ordered Jesus? Peter is ordering Jesus. He's got got some nerve here. He's sternly admonishing Jesus. He's forbidding him, saying, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. He's saying, God forbid you should suffer. He's saying, God forbid you should be killed. No, you, Jesus, must be spared. I have a plan for you, Jesus. You, You must be spared. God forbid you should be killed. No, this plan of yours can't happen he's saying. Peter is literally attempting to turn Jesus away from the good plan of God and steer him toward a different plan instead, just like 
a serpent in a garden once did long ago to the very first Adam. And just as a serpent in a garden, just as a serpent in the wilderness had attempted to do just a few years earlier to this last Adam. And here Jesus sees this same snake lurking again behind Peter's words and says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So what Peter failed to understand with his human thoughts, the thoughts that you and I think most of the time, what he failed to understand with his human thoughts that naturally sought safety, right? We, we tend to seek safety and glory first instead of suffering. What he failed to see was that the plan he was trying to stop was much bigger than he could see. Much bigger. The messianic mission was much greater than saving them from Rome and reestablishing their nation to power and prominence. It was much greater than redeeming a single nation. The messianic mission meant far more than propping up a crumbling nation. God's great daring plan was to start the world over. His plan was to hit the reset button on everything, starting with the resurrection of the human heart. Jesus had, to come, Jesus had come to create a new humanity from the inside out. And to do that, he first had to suffer and die on a cross. He was to do this as a substitute sacrifice to pay the price you and I deserve to pay for our sin and rebellion against God. The first Adam failed to obey God at a tree and won for us all the judgment and wrath of God. Thanks, Adam. And now the last Adam had come to obey God for us and die on another tree in order to win for us peace with God. Thank you, Jesus. And God agreed to punish Jesus for your sin. He agreed to punish Jesus for what you did, while at the same time granting to you Jesus' perfect goodness in exchange simply for believing that Jesus did all this for you. What good news. And we know that Jesus succeeded in this plan and that God the Father approved of and honored his self-sacrifice. Because, because why? Because he raised Jesus from the dead, just as Jesus had predicted. God did this as a sign and as a promise of all that awaits, of what awaits all sinners who put their trust in Christ. Because the cross was not an accident or an afterthought or a mission of madness like Peter thought. It was the perfect plan of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit agreed upon in eternity past to save sinners like you and like me. This was the plan both the devil and Peter tried to stop. But you cannot separate the Christ from the cross. They're always connected. And if you look at the outline in your bulletins this morning, you'll see I've, I've written down five of these connections between the Christ and the cross that I see in chapter 16. I've, if you were here when we uh, left off last, you'll see I've included the first three connections we studied last time. That, number one, the, the road of the Christ must lead to the cross. Number two, the rebuke of the Christ is on account of the cross. And that three, the resolve of the Christ is that nothing stand in the way of the cross, not even Peter. Not even Peter. But now we come to the fourth connection. You know, I imagine poor Peter still standing there, stunned in the road, still trying to process the rebuke that has come so soon after such great praise from Jesus. And now Jesus turns to look at the other disciples. You know, I'm betting they're just standing there too. You know, they're, they're probably all just as shocked. They're probably all just as horrified as Peter at Christ's mention of his suffering and death. And so maybe Jesus looks at them now as if to say, if this is what's coming, will you still follow me? Maybe Jesus looks at them now as if to say, will you try and stop me too? Whatever the look on Jesus' face, these are the very next words of Jesus according to Matthew. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The Christ and the cross are always connected. And this is, this is the fourth connection we're going to look at this morning. The requirement of the Christ is for disciples to take up the cross. The requirement of the Christ is for the disciples to take up the cross. It's, you know, it's as, if, it's as if Jesus is taking this moment to clarify what following him really looks like. What, you know, to clarify what discipleship really means. And then asking, who's still in? Right? Who's still with me? I watched a movie recently about the 12 Special Forces soldiers who were the first into Afghanistan after 9-11, and their, their mission was so risky that their commander had to tell them up front that the chances of surviving it weren't great. And then, you know, he, he said something to the effect of, knowing this, I understand if you don't want to come along. Right? Kind of a show of hands sort of thing. I understand if you don't want to come. That's what this moment with Jesus and the disciples feels like too. Yes, Jesus seems to say, it's clear that you all thought coming after me meant one thing. <laughs> it's, it's clear you thought it meant one thing. It's clear it, you thought it meant thrones and crowns and kingdoms, perhaps. Earthly honor, prosperity, glory, right now. In this life, but none of that is promised to any of you in this life, Jesus says. No, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What does that mean? Jesus makes his statement apply to anyone at all who sets their heart on being a disciple, and he says that such a person must deny himself. Take up his cross and follow him. So what does that mean? I think it means two main things. First, I think it means that anyone who has their heart set on being a disciple must be willing to obey Jesus even to the death. And secondly, I think it means that anyone who has their heart set on being a disciple must be willing to identify with Jesus in his death. I'll explain what those two things Mean First, a disciple must be willing to obey Jesus. And this starts with denying yourself. Right? That's something we all love to do. The word for deny used here means to deny utterly. It means means to disown, to, to affirm that one has no connection to something or someone. In fact, it's the same word used of Peter's denial of Christ. No connection with this person, right? He swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Only now this is the thing a true disciple must do to himself if he or she wishes to follow Jesus. So so what does it mean to deny or disown yourself? I think the main thing it means is surrendering your rights to personal autonomy. Autonomy means a law to oneself. It's the idea of self-rule, of of being free and independent of outside constraints. Americans love autonomy. We love our freedom. It's to have the final say. It's to have the right to control your own life. It means to do whatever you want to do and go wherever you want to go. But see, there's a problem here because to follow someone else means, by definition, that you're not leading anymore. That we're we're not in charge anymore. It it means we're literally putting someone else before us and yielding to their preferences and their desires and their direction. That's, That's the idea, I think, behind deny yourself. It means renouncing your citizenship in the kingdom of you, along with all the rights that come with that citizenship, and considering yourself now to be a permanent citizen in the kingdom of Christ. In order to follow Him, in order to respond in obedience to His will and His desires, you must first deny yourself. I think Paul's words elsewhere help us here. He tells us that the self-denial of discipleship looks like doing what Jesus did to follow His own Father. 
Paul says in Philippians 2.8 that Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know, what's clear is that the suffering of the cross was not the preference of Jesus' human will. Referring to the suffering and death and judgment for our sin that was coming, Jesus prayed these words in the Garden of Gethsemane, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. He didn't want that cup of suffering. And yet, in the end, he still yielded his own will and instead picked up his Father's will, even though it would mean his own literal death. He finishes that prayer this way, Nevertheless, not as I will, but what? But as you will. You know, some of you remember those, own, those, those choose your own ending books, right? Where at key points in the story, you could decide what happened next and change the outcome. Jesus refuses to choose his own ending. He didn't consider his life to be his own to live. There in the garden, because he was following the lead of his father, Jesus denied himself and he took up his father's will. And this ended up looking like death on a cross. And so as Jesus speaks to Peter and and the other disciples here, he's saying that taking up a cross and following him means death. At the very least, the death of self-rule and a yielding to the rule of another. He's saying that to take up a cross means one should come expecting to die to themselves. And the disciples get this metaphor. They don't, they don't miss the present imperative of his words that mean this taking up of a cross is something a disciple must keep doing daily until the day they die. They all know very well that those who picked up a cross beam under Roman rule carried it to their place of execution where they were then attached to it permanently until their death. They all know they all know that by saying a disciple must take up a cross, Jesus is saying to come after him means one must come expecting never to part from it again. They know he's inviting them to come and die. And of course, he's not saying that following him means every disciple should come expecting literal death. Many of them experience literal death for following Jesus. But that's that's not what he's saying every disciple should expect. But he is saying that following him means you should come expecting, at the very least, to sacrifice the primacy of your own will. You should come expecting at the very least, as Paul puts it in Romans 12, 1, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, which means you should come expecting to lay down on the altar your comfort, your reputation, your security, your finances, your own feelings and desires, your own preferences, your own ideas of identity, your own opinions about right and wrong, your own interests your own goals, your own dreams. You should come expecting to lay these down and take up instead God's will in all these areas. You should come expecting to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. You should come expecting to say, God, all of these things I now yield to your control and to your direction and to what you instruct me to do in your word. My life is yours to command. You should come expecting to say, not as I will, but as you will. And the good news, the good news is that in all likelihood, God won't start by telling you to head for the kind of cross you dread most. He probably won't. He probably won't ask you, for instance, to immediately quit your job and move to Afghanistan to be a missionary, although he might but he probably won't. Instead, most likely, God will say to you something like, great, let's start at home. If you're a husband or a wife, you can obey me by submitting to each other and putting the needs of the other before your own. So also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
Ephesians 5, 24 or 25. He says, great, if you're a parent, you can obey me by being patient with your children. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Ephesians 6, 4. He says, great, if you're a child, you can obey me by obeying your parents. Children, where are all the children? They're gone. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. If you're single, you can obey me by using your freedom to be engaged in kingdom work. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit, 1 Corinthians 7, 33 and 34. And you say, God, I'm doing all that. I'm, I'm doing great. Piece of cake. What else you got? So God says, great. Now you can obey me at church. Why don't we start by going? And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Hebrews 10, 25 and 26. God says, great, then you can obey me by getting baptized if you haven't already. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 2.38. God says, then you can obey me by continuing to learn about me. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.18. Then you can obey me by seeing how you can serve in the church. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, Romans 12, <clears throat> 6 through 8. And you say to God, all these I have kept from my youth, God. You're making this too easy. And God will say, great, now you can obey me at work. If you're an employer, you can obey me by treating your workers well. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven, Colossians 4.1. If you're an employee, you can obey me by treating your employer with respect, doing your best, whether he's looking or not, doing your work for him as though he were me. Bondservants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, Ephesians 6, 5 through 7. And if you're a student, he says, that's your job. You can obey me by studying hard and turning in your homework on time. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him, Colossians 3.17. And God says, what? You, you need more? You think you're done? Now you can obey me as a citizen. You can obey me by praying for your leaders. I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, even the ones you didn't vote for. And when you're done praying for them, you can obey me by paying your taxes and respecting those I've placed over you. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, Revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed, Romans 13, 1 and 7. And we could go on and on. So that you might say to me, Pastor, with a list like that, I could spend the rest of my life trying to obey God in ways that rub me the wrong way, in ways that mess with my preferences and my Plans, don't you understand? I could spend the rest of my life obeying God in ways that are inconvenient and unglamorous and uncomfortable. And I would smile at you. And I would say yes. And now you're beginning to understand what it means to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Jesus. But don't worry. He'll help you. 
You cannot separate the Christ from the cross. But now secondly, I think to take up your cross and follow Jesus also means to identify with Jesus in his death. What do I, what do I mean? You know, whenever we do baptisms at Westside Church, and our next baptisms are just this next Sunday, we always give a per- every person who gets baptized, we give them a, a small wooden cross that's been handmade by someone in this church. And we do this for two reasons. First, the first reason we give them a cross, we do this because baptism is a picture of your sins being washed away through faith in the work of Christ on the cross and the new life promised by his resurrection. And second, we give out these crosses as a reminder that now the baptized person is officially joining all other disciples of Christ's church who must bear the symbol of our Savior and our faith openly in their lives. Openly. It's a reminder that they are taking up their cross daily and are following Jesus. Because because just as baptism is a very public thing, so our faith must be a public thing. You can come to church and you can make a profession of faith in the quiet of your heart and only God may know about it. I may know about it if you raise your hand when I ask you to sometimes. But it's hard to hide being dunked underwater. People notice. It causes a splash. Things around you get wet. And when you get out, it leaves footprints. And those footprints will fall in line behind a man carrying a cross. And what we need to understand is that that cross carries a stigma in this world, a mark of disgrace. It has, and it has since the beginning. You know, it's true for a period in in our country, in our culture, the cross came to represent something respectable, sometimes even cool. People you know, still have cross jewelry, but I think it's fair to say, I think it's fair to say that in recent years, the cross is on its way back to regaining some of its stigma, some of its marks of disgrace, of representing something shameful in our culture. Just look at the way those who take up the cross of Christ are paraded today like moral criminals through the public square of social media. It's increasingly similar to the way one sentenced to die on a cross used to be paraded publicly through the town on their way to their execution. As a matter of procedure that took place in every work of execution in Rome and in Roman provinces, writes R.C. Sproul, the convicted person was required to carry the crossbeam of the cross from their place of judgment to their place of execution, which Jesus himself would be required to do at the time of his death. And Jesus says, you want to follow me? Then you might as well right now go pick up that cross beam. And you might as well carry it with you every day because that symbol of ignominy, that symbol of death, that symbol of shame will be like a sign on your chest if you call yourself by my name. And so the second thing it means to take up your cross and follow Jesus is to be willing to identify with the stigma of Christ and of his cross for the rest of your life. You need to know that taking up your cross and falling in line behind Jesus will mean receiving much of the same treatment Jesus received. You know, why, why was Jesus treated that way at the end? You know... You couldn't have found a nicer guy, right? It's not because he wasn't loving enough. He suffered and died because most people found his perfect love too offensive. Because his perfect love not only did the things we all like, his perfect love not only lifted the labeled and championed the canceled and served the segregated and embraced the excluded, we like all of those things. But his perfect love also called out sin and demanded repentance. And that kind of love was too threatening to personal autonomy. That was too harmful 
to personal feelings. It was too different from personal preferences. And so Jesus had to be silenced. He had to be canceled. He had to be literally crossed off the face of the earth. So that the cross Jesus carried to the place of his execution was a public service announcement to everyone who saw it that said, this man has been canceled. This man, we do not recognize him. We do not receive him. We do not approve of him. We will not follow him or have him tell us what to do with our lives. We curse him and any who are with him. Are you willing to identify with that kind of stigma? With the kind of stigma that comes with following Jesus? Because no matter how nice and kind and loving and winsome you are, which you should all be, No matter how kind and winsome and loving you are, eventually there is going to be someone who looks at you with suspicion and not curiosity and says, aren't you also one of his disciples? And then, assuming you don't deny him like Peter, your own persecution will begin. The bottom line is this, if you want Christ, if you want to know him, if you want to love him, if you want to follow him, You need to know that he comes with a cross. You cannot separate the Christ from the cross. Now, maybe you think, you know, you're listening to this, and you think you can escape a cross altogether if you just choose to live your own life your own way. I mean, because I know that it doesn't sound like much fun to take up your cross and follow Jesus. Maybe you're sitting here and you're like, what are you Christians talking about? I I don't want anything to do with that. I don't want to take up my cross and follow Jesus. I I like the way Elizabeth Elliot sometimes was very dry in her humor. She dryly puts it this way, talking about Jesus. He has things to do in our souls that we are not interested in, (laughs) right? Right? Right. I think we all get that. You know, so maybe you're hearing all this and you think if you just go your own way, you might escape all the crosses. But if you think that, you'd be wrong. Jesus says so in verse 25. For whoever would save his life, he says, will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What does Jesus mean? This is the second time Jesus has said something like this. And the idea here is the same as it was back when he said it in chapter 10. You know, I think most specifically he's referring to the kind of life, the kind of expectations. Let's try and remember the context of his words. I think he's speaking most specifically to the kind of life and expectations that Peter and the rest of the twelve are struggling to let go of at this moment, right? Remember, they're being faced with the loss of the hopes and the dreams of earthly glory and honor in an earthly kingdom restored by the kind of Messiah they grew up hearing about. They're having to face the death of a a dream here. And so Jesus is trying to shake loose their grip on the wrong thing. He's saying, if you insist on holding on to your own ideas and refuse to follow my lead, you'll end up with nothing. But if you let go of your own understanding and trust me, if you will trust me, you'll end up with everything. That's what I think Jesus is saying most specifically here. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Maybe applied more broadly, I think Jesus is saying that whoever seeks to preserve life on their own terms right now by refusing to follow him will in the end fail to have preserved any kind of life for themselves at all. Why? Because such a person will have walked away from the one who would take their autonomy, yes, but who also would have taken their sins and paid for them. Listen, if you embrace Christ's cross now, Jesus says you will lose some of the things you hold dear. But in the end, it will be your salvation. And if you try to escape Christ's cross now. You will gain some of the things you hold dear, 
But in the end, it will be your judgment. For those who will die to themselves and follow Jesus right now, putting their trust in him, they will, in the end, find themselves possessing abundant life because in Jesus, their sins are paid for. And in Jesus, they've been raised from death to life. But for those who choose to live life on their own terms, the hard fact is that even then you won't escape a cross. No, you'll still bear one. The only difference will be that in the end, that cross will be your judgment instead of your salvation. About such a person, Charles Spurgeon writes this, I see a soul carrying about itself the instrument of its own destruction and going onward to its doom. Sin is the cross to which this soul will be fastened, and habits and depravities are the nails. This soul is bearing its sin and loving to bear it. See, it is going to execution, but at each step it laughs. Every step it takes is bearing it toward hell, and yet it makes mirth. Lo, the infatuated one scoffs at the voices that warn him, and every scoff he utters is increasing his guilt. And so Jesus now asks his disciples, and he now asks all of us, is that really worth it? Is bearing that kind of cross, is living that kind of life really worth it? Is life on your own terms really worth it? Look at verse 26. For what will it profit a man? If he gains the whole world and forfeits his life or his soul, or what shall a man give in return for his life? This word for profit, for what will it profit a man? It's in the passive voice. In other words, what profit will such a person receive? What benefit will such a person receive in the future because he rescued his life from going down the path that followed Jesus right now? If right now this person succeeds in gaining everything he desires of this life by remaining autonomous and following his heart, what kind of return will that bring him in the future? Let's say you gain all the friends in the world. Good for you. What benefit will you receive from all those friends on the day God requires of you your soul? Will they count for more than friendship with Jesus who sticks closer than a brother to those who choose to follow him? Let's say you gain all the pleasure in the world. What benefit will you receive from all that pleasure on the day God requires of you your soul? Can all your passing pleasures outlast the unending pains of hell? Will the sum of them be worth more than the pleasures found forevermore at the right hand of God? Let's say you gain all the power in the world. What benefit will you receive from all that power on the day God requires of you your soul? Will it be able to subdue the power of the grave? Will it be able to overcome the one who has the power to throw you in hell? Let's say you gain all the wealth in the world. What benefit will you receive from all that on the day God requires of you your soul? Will you be able to buy off the retributive justice of God? Will you be able to do more? Will will it be able, your wealth, will it be able to do more for you than the immeasurable riches of God's grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. What will it profit a man? He gains the whole world and forfeits his life. Or, to put it another way, Jesus now adds, what shall a man give in return for his life? Philip's translation puts the question this way, what could a man offer to buy back his soul once he had lost it? It's a rhetorical question question, the clear point is that there's nothing of equal value you could give, right? Yes, he'd trade everything in a heartbeat. He'd trade anything he could for a second chance at life, but he's he's got nothing left to offer God because he's already spent his whole life. It's too late. Jesus' question is just 
another way of pointing out that it's the end of the race and such a man has bet on the wrong horse. Even if he tries to give God his already spent life, all the friends, all the pleasure, all the power, all the wealth, if he tries to push this into God's hands, it's like trying to give God $10 worth of toys in exchange for a house. It reminds me of a, a pattern I've seen repeat itself several times in my children. <laughs> One of my boys in particular will get these really grand schemes about something he wants to buy, and then for several weeks... He'll do extra chores around the house to earn money. And then one day he'll take out his jar of savings and he'll dump it all out on the kitchen table and he'll, he'll count it all up and he'll triumphantly announce that he has $10. Ten whole dollars. And then I watch the light die in his eyes <laughs> as he finds out how much the thing is that he actually wants to buy, you know, 300 bucks. Well, normally what happens next? Well, what normally happens in my house is that that kid is impatient and decides it's not worth it to wait and save. And so he takes that $10 and goes and buys $10 worth, worth of trinkets, right? $10 worth of junk. But then there was a time he did something different. That time he got up to $10, then he got up to $20, and he got up to $30, and each time I thought he was going to cave for sure especially the time when he was up to $30 and $40 and $50 and his siblings were spending their $10 on junk. Thought he was going to cave. But this time he decided he was going to hold out and suffer the short term in order to get the good thing he really wanted. And when he finally got that thing, do you, he, he did it, he got that thing. Do you know what happened? The other kids who had been impatient and spent their money already said it wasn't fair. That's not fair. And trust me, they wanted to trade all their $10 trinkets for that much better thing. But they'd already made their decision. And Jesus is saying, you've got to make a decision too. You've got to decide if you want to get your good things now or later. It won't take anything but impatience to get your good things now, but it will take trust if you decide to wait and get your good things later. In fact, to get your good things later, it will require trusting Christ through a cross. Because you cannot separate the Christ from the cross. They're always connected. And the fifth connection now is this, that the, the recompense or the reward of the Christ comes on the far side of the cross. If you decide your priority is to get your good things now, Jesus is saying you need to just know it means you won't get the best things later. You'll lose out on your life. Yep, you'll get all the trinkets, you'll get all the, the baubles you want, all manner of $10 junk toys, but you'll miss out on the big ticket item in the end. You will forfeit your life, your soul. And at that point, it will be too late to say it's not fair. At that point, it's going to be too late to try and negotiate some kind of deal. Or what shall a man give in return for his life? Verse 27, For the Son of Man is going to come with His angels in the glory of His Father, and then He will repay each person according to what He has done. You know, if the disciples had been listening carefully here, I think they would have heard another word of hope from Jesus. For now, they can't shake the terrible image of his suffering and his death, and, and neither can they shake the understanding of what that's going to mean for them if they follow him, right? Because after all, as goes the master, so go the disciples. But Jesus has already told them death is not the end. He's already told them God will raise him up. There is vindication and reward in his words if they will hear it. And not only that, he's also just used, once again, his favorite nickname for himself and said he will come back in glory. Remember that thing they wanted? Glory, honor. He's going to come back in glory. How could he do that if suffering and death got the last word? 
For the Son of Man is going to come with His angels in the glory of His Father. And when He comes, what will He do? He will repay each person according to what He has done, the text says. Yes, He will repay each person with judgment who rejected the way of the cross and chose to live his or her best life now. But He will also come and at long last repay them. Each one of His disciples who denied Himself and took up His cross and followed Him. You know, there's something we say when we're talking about giving our money to God for kingdom purposes. Maybe you've heard it. We say, you can't outgive God. And it's true. You can't outgive God. The same is true of your life. You may give and give and give for God's kingdom. You may pour out your life like Paul as a fragrant offering to Jesus. You may forsake many of the pleasures of this world. You may... You may sacrifice your dreams to love your spouse or to love your neighbor or to minister and love your boss. You may consider countless pains in your life as joy in the service of Christ. That's wonderful. But the perspective of the disciple of Jesus is this, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Because the promise for the disciple of Jesus is that he or she will never be able to outgive God. The promise for the disciple of Jesus who suffers now is that Jesus will repay you with far more than you ever lost for him. Let's stop there and pray.